I don't know how good Audible is at Sekiro, but they sponsored this video anyway. Here we go. Sekiro Shadows Die Twice is a game about following instructions. Here are what the instructions look like. It doesn't look like instructions, I admit. It looks like a blisteringly fast series of slashes from an impossibly acrobatic sword man. But they are, I promise, instructions. Sekiro is the oddest duck in the lineage of hard sword games developed by From Software. All the games have their own personalities. Dark Souls plays differently from Bloodborne, plays differently from Elden Ring. But all of those other games also have things in common. Things like the simple fact that you can repeatedly grind through lower level enemies for experience and use that experience to increase your amount of health. In those games, if your sword isn't doing enough damage, you can leave what you're doing, go scavenge for scraps elsewhere, and use those scraps to make your sword stronger. Sekiro refuses this kind of piecemeal stats-based improvement. There are a few items that can make you stronger in Sekiro, but ultimately, getting better at the game is just about honing your ability to work within the game's second-to-second -second systems. There is no stat improvement that can take you from this to this. It's just you. This fact does not make Sekiro objectively the hardest of the hard sword games, nor the easiest. But what it does is present a very different fantasy of difficulty than those other games, and it's one uniquely suited to my particular obsessions. It's a game that presents a seemingly insurmountable brick wall and tells you that you can, in fact, surmount it. Not by outleveling it, but by getting to know the brick wall so intimately, understanding it so perfectly, that eventually the wall will feel like an old friend. At the end, your knuckles may be bloodied and your shoulder may be bruised, but you'll realize that the wall has opened a door to you specifically, and you can simply walk through. The brick wall of difficulty won't be limiting, it will be liberating. What are the instructions that can open up the door in the wall? Well, they're remarkably simple. Every attack in the game, with the exception of a few denoted by the Danger Red Kanji, can be deflected. It is the correct thing to do in virtually every combat situation. When an enemy swings their sword at you, or a bull charges at you, or a demon stomps on you, you deflect. There is obviously more going on in the combat system, but that's all a kind of decoration on the absolute bedrock of this is a game in which you are supposed to deflect attacks. If you can follow that one instruction, you will likely be able to finish this game. Let's talk specifically about one move. It's performed by a character named Genichiro, one of the first really significant bosses of the game. The technical name of it is Floating Passage, though I just think of it as the super fast million slash move. It is not his only move, he's got a whole book of them, but it's intimidating enough to seem like a brick wall of difficulty, especially on your first encounter with it. There are a couple ways that you can interact with this move, which I'll demonstrate here. The first way of interacting with the attack is just utter failure. He's swinging around and you walk into the swings and you get hit by all of them and fall over and probably die. This is the most obvious way you could be overcome by this move, but it's not actually one that's particularly likely to happen. To have progressed this far in Sekiro, you'll have probably picked up a sort of survival instinct, which is to mash the left bumper really fast. Holding that button just puts you into a sort of standard block position, but this sort of block is not useful for much in this game. Instead, what you want is a deflect, which will happen if you block almost exactly as a strike hits you. The problem, starting out, is you're not quite sure when a strike is going to hit you, so you do a lot of this. This wiggle comes from me just pressing the block button over and over, with the idea being that if I hit it rapidly enough, I'll hopefully get some kind of deflect just by chance. That's what causes the second type of interaction with the attack, which is what I'll call the good enough. Mashing block can get you through this. 
you might notice that the moments when our blades connect aren't especially dynamic looking. They're kind of dull. That's because the game knows you're mashing, and while it won't outright flunk you for doing so, and you might still avoid taking damage from the flurry, it's not really an ideal way of getting through. Every time you block a strike in Sekiro, this bar on the bottom goes up. It's your posture, basically. And if the posture bar maxes out, you'll briefly collapse and be totally open to enemy attacks. The thing is, poorly executed blocks like this one, ones with the dull sparks that come from mashing, they increase that posture bar a lot. What that means is even if your mashing gets you through the super fast million slash move, the enemy is likely going to follow up with more attacks and you'll be very close to exhaustion already. It's sort of like sprinting the first stretch of a marathon. Yeah, you're technically moving towards the goal, but that strategy will exhaust you long before you get there. This second method looks totally different from the utter failure of the first approach. You're not getting hit, you're using the tools of the game. But the similarity between these two, even if the person performing the second approach doesn't recognize it, is they are both not properly following the instructions. In any suitably difficult game, the worst thing that can happen is getting stuck. And there are so many versions of stuck. It could be that you're unable to figure out a puzzle, or didn't bring enough ammo to a boss fight, or simply can't find the place you're supposed to go next. And depending on the game, being stuck can have incredibly high stakes. The worst that can happen if you can't figure out a puzzle is you turn to someone else or the internet for help. That's not so terrible. But there are more infamous cases, like early Resident Evil games, where you could softlock yourself, make the game actually impossible to complete through your incorrect resource management. It's the worst kind of stuck. Don't have enough ammo for this boss fight? Too bad. Start the whole game again, and remember to bring more next time. But I'd argue the scariest kind of stuck doesn't have to do with puzzles or resources. It's simply about ability. What if, we've probably all said to ourselves, what if I'm just not good enough to get through this? It's not a matter of preparation or knowledge. I know what I'm supposed to do, and I just can't pull it off. This is the fear that Sekiro wields. There is no overleveling, no different build to try or resources to hoard. You're either able to follow the instructions, or you can't. One of my favorite chapters in Robert Persig's Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance is on the concept of stuckness. The book, one of the best-selling philosophy texts of our modern era, is essentially what the name promises. Persig tells the semi-autobiographical story of himself and his son going on a cross-country motorcycle trip, while also explaining his very particular philosophical perspective. To be honest, I am not a philosophy student, and a lot of his theorizing goes way over my head. The most effective parts for me are the ones that make good on the book's title, when Persig uses the process of motorcycle maintenance to explain his concepts. And that's where stuckness comes in. Persig asks us to imagine we're working on a bike, and the side cover assembly has a screw that we can't get off. The screw isn't the reason that the bike needs maintenance, it's just a little thing stopping us from fixing the real problem. But that screw won't come out, and our increasingly frustrated attempts to force it out only succeed in tearing the slot, making it all the more impossible. Your mind was already thinking ahead to what you would do when the cover plate was off, and so it takes a little time to realize that this irritating minor annoyance of a torn screw slot isn't just irritating and minor. You're stuck, stopped, terminated. It's absolutely stopped you from fixing the motorcycle. He says, we don't need any scientific experiments to know what's wrong. We know what's wrong. The dang screw is stuck. And yet that screw represents the zero moment of consciousness, a miserable experience that only results in lost time and feelings of incompetence. He continues, it's normal at this point for the fear-anger syndrome to take over. 
You think about it, and the more you think about it, the more you're inclined to take the whole machine to a high bridge and drop it off. It's just outrageous that a tiny little slot of a screw can defeat you so easily. When I hear that line, I can't help but think about the classic hallmarks of gamer rage, shattered controllers and broken monitors and fist-sized holes through dorm walls. And the solution, Persig says, won't result in you not getting stuck. Nothing can prevent that. But what you can do is welcome the stuck and use it as an opportunity to look at the problem with a beginner's mind, to take a step back and attempt to separate what's meaningful in the situation from all the other noise. He says that we think of a screw as unimportant because it's small and cheap and simple. But here, now, a screw is the most important. It's worth the entire value of the motorcycle. And this recontextualization of the problem, not as a minor annoyance, but as important as any other individual piece of the whole, can shake your mind out of its rigid perception of a screw and the equally rigid ways it can be dealt with. He says that eventually, your mind will naturally and freely move toward a solution. The solution will likely not rock the world. Maybe it's investigating solvents, or researching screw extractors, or calling a knowledgeable friend, or burning it out with a torch. Or maybe, he says, the result of your meditative attention to the screw will result in some wholly new method that's never been thought of before. Whatever it is will likely seem simple, but only after you've arrived at it. One of the most effective ways of improving against the seemingly insurmountable From Software boss is to simply not fight it. At first, at least. Repeated failed attempts mean almost nothing in these games, so acknowledge that, and embrace that, and spend a few minutes or hours not attacking at all, just watching and learning and internalizing the boss's pattern of attacks. Maybe you will find the key to a boss's instructions while simply observing them. Another method is to record yourself playing and watch it back. Virtually every console and PC has a built-in screen record now, and it's far easier to recognize your own bad habits in retrospect. A third incredibly effective way of improving is to simply watch someone else do it. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of videos of people overcoming every enemy in these games, and often, removing yourself from the pressure of the situation allows you to see AI behaviors and player strategies you weren't able to notice before. I bring up these strategies, just a few of the countless different methods of learning, because there's this stink that pervades popular conceptions of difficult games. Although I've met very few real-life people who believe this, the stink comes from the idea that even if a game is hard, especially if a game is hard, the only legitimate way through it is to do it alone, without guidance or help. The stink implies that having assistance makes a victory less sweet, that getting support means an achievement is less genuine. This, I should point out, is not how any other learning in real life works. Imagine a math class where the only legitimate way to pass was exclusively using the textbook and never asking a question, or a workout regimen where you weren't allowed to learn technique from others because you should figure it out on your own. It's this rigidity of thinking that there's only one way to truly surmount a game's challenges that locks people into the controller-smashing, wall-punching realm of stuckness. Sekiro doesn't offer many ways to overlevel past enemies, it's true. It does, at the end, boil down to ability. But even ability isn't a simple linear progression. There are many ways to learn instructions, and many different styles of following them. The third type of interaction with Genishiro's floating passage is one I learned about from an internet stranger. It is very clever. See, the hardest part of his attack isn't the first two strikes, and it's not the last one either. It's all these in the middle. He throws out those middle attacks really fast, and if you get hit by one, you'll likely get hit by all of them. But you can actually sidestep them completely by deflecting his first two strikes and then simply stepping backwards, letting him flail in the air for a while. Then you can step back in and deflect the last one, still doing a big chunk of posture damage to him and getting this cool stance that you can attack from. 
I think this strategy is what I used to beat him the first time. This technique for me was my moment of unstuckness, figuring out how to take out the screw that had been holding the whole assembly hostage. And from that moment, the rest of the game opened up, not because the floating passage is the most difficult attack, but because if I was stuck again, I knew that unstuck would be just a matter of time. That's how I completed my first run through of Sekiro, using every avenue available to me to learn enough to surmount the insurmountable. And it was a wonderful experience. But there's a fourth type of interaction with Genishiro's floating passage, in some ways the most simple interaction, because you just do it. You do exactly what the instructions say. Every time he attacks, all nine times, you deflect. And it was the thought of this that kept me coming back. Because ultimately, the promise of Sekiro is that if you want it enough, you can do it perfectly. The thing Sekiro can do that real life can't is be perfectly programmatically consistent. And because it can do that, it offers me the fantasy of perfect reactive preparation that I can see every single thing coming my way and respond with exactly the intended behavior. As satisfying as getting unstuck is, what's even more powerful for me is the ability to blow past those tricky places from before, to learn every piece of the boss so your fight resembles not so much a struggle as a beautifully composed orchestra with every sword following the music. And a few months ago, I was playing the Ganeshiro fight again and again, getting closer and closer to perfection, and then the thought hit me like a lightning bolt. God damn it, I should start playing piano again. Look, I know, and I'm sorry, this is the last act twist of every video essay where the author segues into some boring story about their real life, but I cannot ignore the fact that the 2019 video game Sekiro Shadows Die Twice motivated me in the year 2022 to start taking piano lessons. When I was a kid, I played piano for the same reason most kids play musical instruments. My parents thought it was a good idea. And I definitely didn't hate it. I learned how to play Duel of the Fates and the James Bond theme and Boulevard of Broken Dreams, becoming, by default, the coolest kid in school. I liked that we had occasional recitals in a nearby mall, but I also never really felt internally motivated to do it. I was in elementary and middle school, and the biggest obstacle to fun in my life was homework, and practicing piano felt like more homework. And so, when I was 12, I asked my parents if I could stop taking piano, and they said yes, and that was that. And then, 15 years later, fighting Ganeshiro for the 27th time in Sekiro, I thought about how much I liked knowing exactly what was coming up and being able to respond perfectly in time, and then I thought, wow, that sounds a lot like sheet music. And then, I emailed a piano tutor. I am nowhere near what I would consider good, obviously. I have a long way to go before I even catch up with myself at 12 years old, but I'm now playing piano for the same reason I keep going back to Sekiro even after I know I can ace it, because within it lies the promise of perfection. Playing piano doesn't feel like homework anymore. Ironically, playing video games kind of does crazy how life works. Instead, every individual piece of sheet music feels like the process of getting better in miniature. I'm able to have that experience of not being able to perform something, going to bed, waking up, and then just being able to do it over and over and over. I found my internal motivation to play piano, and it is somehow the same sensation that keeps me coming back to Sekiro. I'm back to piano because I just can't resist the feeling of getting better, and that's also why I'm still trying to deflect every single one of Ganeshiro's blows. Occasionally, I'll have a conversation with someone who seems surprised that I'm not super interested in making my own video game. And similarly, I'm not learning piano out of a desire to eventually create my own music. What I sometimes struggle to describe in these conversations is that my goal, what I want to achieve, is to connect myself to someone else's art at the highest possible level. 
By learning every intricacy of a game systems or a song's sheet music, I can also learn to understand the art that I love a little more. I am, in effect, simply following the instructions laid out for me by someone else. But there is a kind of inner peace I find in that, a clear direction to follow that, in pursuing, I can get just a hair closer to perfection. While this is an easy one for Audible to sponsor, I even mentioned a specific novel previously in this video, so of course I'm going to recommend that you use Audible to listen to a collection of short stories! Terraform is the name of a short story collection that just came out, and it's one of the most exciting gatherings of stories I've seen in a long time, with dozens of authors, including Jeff Vandermeer, tackling dozens of different topics. The audiobook is divided into three broad sections, Watch Worlds Burn, and man oh man does it earn those sections. Many of these stories are, are deeply angry in a way that makes them both energizing and cathartic. I mean, I'm telling you, the foreword to this book alone is worth the price of admission. Fortunately for you, that price can be nothing. Audible has given me a special code that I'm now giving you, which will get you a whole free month and a free audiobook. Audible.com slash Jacob Geller is where you can go to redeem the free month, or you can text Jacob Geller to 500-500. Either works. Either will get you Terraform for free, as well as access to Audible's nearly endless collections. I'm always happy to do an Audible sponsorship because they're basically a chance for me to tell you about my favorite audiobooks of the year, and this is absolutely up at the top. You can listen to stories about corporate subversion, or the end of big data, or drifting into space and never returning, and you can do it all without paying a cent by following the link in the description or texting Jacob Geller to 500-500. Terraform. Watch worlds burn.